Hey, Bankless Nation. Wow, it is panel time. Super excited about this panel. It's all about loot. If you've not heard of loot, David, could you give a quick description of what loot is and why we're hosting this panel? Oh, that's that's so hard because the whole point about loot is that it has no description. Descriptions need to be built around the loot. And that is the fundamental like unlock that this whole loot phenomenon has brought upon the world. Like traditional NFTs, uh, we all know them as JPEGs. We joke about them like, oh yeah, they're JPEGs. Loots aren't even JPEGs. They are just tokens that have properties inside of them. And the whole idea is that a world can be built around these things rather than have them actually impose upon the world what they look like. And this is, it's really just a writing prompt. It's a blank slate uh, of such a possibly gargantuan like magnitude that it's attracted a ton of attention and a ton of a ton of frenzied energy. And the thing is, like the the way the promise of loot is that since we're building around it rather than actually building it up from the from the top down, it's it's coming from a, a bottom up perspective. There is no team. There is no roadmap. There is no project. There's only a nebulous decentralized set of contributors who are committed to building this thing. Uh, and so we have brought three of those contributors here on the panel today. We've got Jackson Dame, who uh, is co-founder of, uh, of uh, or excuse me, the content creator and community manager at the Rainbow Wallet. We also have Will Papper, who is co-founder of Syndicate DAO and also the mentor of Adventure Gold. And Anish Agnihotri, which is one of uh, Paradigm's newest research associates. Uh, and these guys all have caught the loot bug. Uh, and so we want to get their perspectives as to what this whole loot thing actually is. Yeah, I think I, we definitely uh, um, need need to figure this out. I, I feel like I owe this one to my wife, David, because I bought loot, right? And like, she already thinks NFTs are crazy, right? But like, now I'm buying um, text files on the blockchain. <laughs> text files on the <laughs> so, blockchain. <laughs> so I feel like uh, many people that are outside of crypto circles uh, also want to understand what this what this loot phenomenon is. Why it has such value? Mm. I mean, tremendous amount of value being attributed to loot itself and then also all of kind of the derivative products. So we're going to dig into all of this. And I, I got to say coming into this, I'm, I'm kind of halfway split where I like, I see the, the, the unlock of this new primitive and it's, it's so exciting and so cool. Mm -hmm. And, and part of me is like, this is the future. Um, this is going to be amazing. And then there's another part of me that's like, um, well, have, have we peaked here? Right. Like, it's just like, <laughs> we're buying text files now right. and there's no game around this thing. Mm -hmm. And it, it, like all people are pricing computers, in the future way too much are pricing in the future like how's this thing how is mm -hmm. this thing going to be built right uh so I, i'm somewhat conflicted and I, I love that conflict because i think that's where the best opportunities lie so guys we are going to get into the subject of loot in this expert panel but before we do we want to thank the sponsors that made this episode possible bankless is proud to be supported by uniswap Uniswap is a new paradigm in asset exchange infrastructure. Instead of a cumbersome order book system where trades are matched with other humans, Uniswap is an autonomous piece of software on Ethereum, which is what Ryan and I call a money robot. No human counterparties or centralized intermediaries, just autonomous code on Ethereum. Input the token you want to sell and receive the token you want to buy. Something brand new in the Uniswap ecosystem is the Uniswap Grants program is now accepting applications for grants. We have been saying this for a while and we'll say it again. DAOs have money and they are in need of labor. If you think that you have something to contribute to the Uniswap DAO, apply for a grant to Uniswap. Just look at the size of the Uniswap treasury. It's almost $3 billion. This mountain of capital is looking for labor. Do you have something of value to contribute to the Uniswap DAO? No matter how big or small your idea is, you can apply for a uni grant at unigrants.org and help steer Uniswap in the direction that you think it should go. That's exactly what we did to get Uniswap to be a sponsor for Bankless, and you can do the same for your project. Thank you, Uniswap, for sponsoring Bankless. The Aave protocol is a decentralized liquidity protocol on Ethereum, which allows users to supply and borrow certain crypto assets. Aave version 2 has a ton of cool features that makes using the Aave protocol even more powerful. With Aave, you can leverage the full power of DeFi money Legos, yield, and composability all in one application. On Aave, there are a ton of assets that you can supply to the protocol in order to gain yield, and all of those same assets can also be borrowed from the protocol if you have supplied collateral. Here you can see me borrowing 200 USDC against my portfolio of a number of different DeFi tokens in ETH. 
I'll choose a variable interest rate because it's a lower rate than the stable interest rate option. But I could choose the stable interest rate option if I wanted to lock in that interest rate in permanently. V2 also features the ability for users to swap collateral without having to withdraw their assets, trade them on Uniswap, and then deposit them back into Aave. With Aave, users can do this in one seamless transaction, saving you time and gas costs. Check out the power of Aave at Aave.com. That's A-A-V-E.com. All right, guys, we are back with the loot panel from Bankless talking all about loot, what this project is, what it means for the future. Did we unlock a new primitive or is this just the hype cycle going crazy here? We've got three panelists who can fill us in on all the details. We've got uh, Anish Agnihotri. He's a research associate at Paradigm. Will um, Papper, he's the co-founder of Syndicate DAO and also the mentor of Adventure Gold as well. And Jackson Dame, he is a content creator and community manager at Rainbow Wallet. Everyone, how's it going? How are, are, do we call you guys looters? Like what's the <laughs> official name for the loot community? Doing great. Uh, looters definitely sounds a little weird, but yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, anyway, it's great to have everyone, you know, I think we got to start with kind of the, the aha moment, um, cause all of us discovered loot in a different way. Um, all of us discovered it in kind of, you know, some digital way, but, um, for, for all of us, I think everybody, including myself, um, it really clicked. Like there was this aha moment of what this primitive could unlock. So I want to start maybe with, um, with you, Jackson. So what was your aha moment? with loot and what convinced you to get involved in the pro project and become a contributor? Yeah, I think my aha moment was actually probably months before it even dropped. Like I, I, I've been following Dom's journey and in, in, in getting into Ethereum and NFTs uh, for many months now. And I was an early adopter of his, one of his first projects, Blitmap. And through that, through being involved with Blitmap and the community that he built around that, I, I already was sort of sold on anything Dom ever did in the future. Um, and because of that, he's also not one of those people that tweets often. So I didn't have, I, I turned notifications on for his tweets so that I would always be aware of what he was doing. And, you know, one day, you know, two weeks ago when he tweeted out the link to this project, this experiment that he did, um, I was already so familiar with his work and like how innovative he is that I was ready to jump on board anything he ever did. So I saw the link and within seconds just clicked on it and started minting these bags of loot without really even thinking that much about it. So it's basically from, from Dom's reputation, you're like, whatever Dom creates, I'm going to ape into this thing and then go figure it out later. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Will, what about you? What was your aha moment? How did uh, loot click in your mind and when? Yeah, so uh, I missed the original loot mint. I was hiking in Oregon um, without uh, anything on me. I didn't have any of my, any, any access to my crypto. Um, that was an expensive hike. So I, I missed the mint. <laughs> and then I was, uh, but I knew that uh, people were talking about how cool it was that loot was fully on chain. And I was like, wow, okay, this is not just another NFT. This is a composable primitive. Um, and I was like, wouldn't it be cool if people could claim an in-game currency? So in the airport in Bend, Oregon, before I owned any loot, I started coding Adventure Gold. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's when it began. Um, because I just thought that on-chain composability was a really powerful thing. Um, got back, was too tired to buy loot that night. Then the next morning, Sunday morning, I, I just uh, sold my me bit and swept the floor for loot um, until I ran out of uh, ran out of ETH. Um, so uh, yeah, Adventure Gold actually began before I held any loot. Um, but the on-chain composability was so cool to me that I knew it would be really powerful. We, we definitely want to get into the story of Adventure Gold a little bit later, but, but for folks that aren't familiar with like, when you say on-chain composability, right? Like to me, I, I kind of know what that means. Like that gives me shivers. I'm like, okay, well, this could be a, a, a primitive for so many other things that are built on top of Ethereum. But like, how would you explain why on-chain-ness makes loot cool in and of itself, Will? Just to, just to somebody who doesn't understand this space. Yeah, so um, most NFTs, their data is a URL, and that might be an IPFS hash, or that might be a centralized server. Um, but most NFTs point to outside of the Ethereum ecosystem, which means that other smart contracts can't leverage the data inside of that NFT because they don't know what that URL contains. There's no way for them to access it. Um, it's, just, it's just a URL to them that doesn't indicate anything about the underlying content. 
the really cool thing about Loot is that Loot stores its properties on chain, which means that other applications can access what kind of headgear does someone have? Are they wearing a crown? Are they wearing a cap? Um, what kind of weapon do they have? What kind of shoes do they have? What kind of armor do they have? And the really cool part about that all being accessible by other applications on top of Ethereum is that like people like Loot Wars, for example, was able to query the weapon that you had and then grant you an actual weapon that you could use in battle. Um, uh, Anish did work on, 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 on being able to split up loot bags into individual items. And all of this is only possible because loot is stored fully on chain, whereas most NFTs are URLs that point somewhere else, in many cases to a centralized server, so other blockchain applications can't access it. Before we uh, go on to Anish, I just want to add that there there is precedent for on-chain NFTs to have a um, premium associated with them for, due to their on-chainness. And we saw this with autoglyphs, right? Autoglyphs have an insane premium versus other typical JPEG NFTs because of their inherent on-chain nature, right? They have no external dependencies. Uh, and so, like, I think people who clicked with loot might have clicked it with that, like, on-chain nature of, of the items. I just wanted to add that, that color. What's super interesting about all of this is, like, um, it appears for some odd reason, maybe for some of the reasons Will, Will was stating, that, like, the simplicity of loot makes it, make, like, uh, that's what makes it so valuable. And that's what makes it so interesting, right? So, so we've gone from something that is like not very complicated at all, uh, GIFs and JPEGs, right? To something like even more simple than that. And it's that simplicity that actually makes it a more valuable primitive to build on top of, right? Um, and- it's, it's a very counterintuitive, I think, to the way people think about value, right? It's like more complicated more time, more effort goes into it, the more valuable it must be. Well, no, here's loot. It's just text files on the internet, but it's that simplicity, that adoption, which makes it so valuable. That's kind of the riddle I think we want to unpack here. But Anisha, I want to get your uh, weigh in on this. So tell us about your aha moment. How did it happen for you? Sure. So in a similar way to Jackson, I followed Dom's work. I'm a big fan of what he's done with Blitmaps and sort of Every time I'm a builder, and so I love taking a look at the smart contracts that people put together. And DOMs are especially unique because he does cool things on chain. And so Loot initially caught my eye because he was doing, you know, rendering these images, rendering these text files directly on chain. And I was like, hey, this is fantastic. Uh, and then immediately right after that, my take was, okay, well, everything is on chain, all of this data is accessible. That means I can quickly scrape all of it and put together a rarity chart that people can now use immediately right after. Uh, and so the first thing that I did, the first sort of derivative that I built on top of Loot was this sort of list of rarity based on the probability of the items inside your bags. Uh, and I shipped it out to the world. And I thought, you know, this is going to be a cool way for people to take a look at how rare the bags that they're minting are. I think my aha moment, though, came a day after that when I realized nobody was following the rarity rankings, which to me came like a surprise. Um, in particular, the rarest bags after the first day were things like divine row bags and katana bags, which are seemingly common items. They're not things that are rare. They're things that are super accessible, uh, just general items in like a tenth of the bags, which to me was an initial surprise. Um, but I think to me, that was the aha moment where I was like, okay, the community building on top of loot and the things that people do with the bags is a lot more important necessarily than what's inside the bags themselves. Uh, so I think that was my aha moment. So just to reemphasize that point, uh, did, did you just say that the, the whole like divine robes, which the divine robes are the one item in the loot ecosystem that have the most premium associated with them. You're saying that that didn't come out as a result of the specific scarcity of divine robes. It was just more a meme that people latched onto. And it's like, oh, we like the divine robes. Yay, divine robes. And all of a sudden there's like two tiers in the discord. Like the divine robes have like a, a floor price that's like five times higher than the actual floor price. And there's no fundamental reason behind that other than just the community kind of just as a shelling point picked divine robes as like the thing that is the most scarce. Exactly. And that's fascinating to watch because it goes entirely against any fundamentals based approach anyone could have done, right? It's something entirely based on the loot community. So guys, um, let's, for the listeners who are still trying to catch up with the loot ecosystem, let's actually go through a timeline. Uh, and I actually don't know which of the three panelists might be actually best to talk about the timeline of the events that unfolded around loot. Uh, does anyone think that they can tell the timeline of loot really, really well? 
Jackson should um, has yeah. He well, has Jackson just got volunteered, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll try my best. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was I was there, you know, from minute one basically. Um, I think I, I have a clear sketch of the first few days, and then after that, it starts getting really crazy. I think that's but, true for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the first, you know, the first like thirty minutes of it was. A relatively small number of people, I feel like, uh, just going on to the smart contract on Etherscan and connecting their wallets and minting these bags for free. Um, but after like the first 30 minutes, it, it it started spreading around on Twitter. And I even created like a simple little guide on Twitter that people could use to, to figure out how to mint it because so many people aren't familiar with minting NFTs on Etherscan. And so... I, I shared this Twitter thread about how to do it. Other people started sharing things and it just went crazy. And within like a two hour period, I think, you know, all basically all the loot bags had been claimed. The gas prices for minting them started skyrocketing because so many people were trying to get on board. Um, and then of course, you know, Anish's work with, you know, the, 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 all the data started like giving people uh new ways to look at it because previously there really wasn't a way to look at it very much. It was just like, here's all these bags. Um, but you had Anisha's data and you had all these other things suddenly starting people trying to query all the data and figure out like what, what is in all these bags and why, why are these bags the way they are? And so you had people asking questions and sort of digging deeper because Dom did not really explain much of anything. He just tweeted this thing out and sort of left it up to people to investigate. Do you think that was um, by design? That was an intentional choice by Dom? I don't, I mean, I don't think so. I think he, uh, I think busy. he's very much the kind of person that's, he has so much going on. He just loves experimenting. I genuinely think he just, he had this fun idea and I was like, I'll just drop this and, you know, go about my day. Um, I don't think he planned any of it, uh, which I, I think makes it all the more special. Um, and then, you know, within several hours, all the people that couldn't have minted the, the loot started trying to buy them on, you know, secondary markets and, you had little, you know, sites being built that would uh, that would filter for specific items. So a, a friend of mine, he he had some divine robes in one of his bags, and he liked the concept of getting all the people who have divine robes together in a private Discord. Um, and then you saw other people doing the same thing, like people who had katanas or dragon skin armor. They were like, well, we want to we want to get together and bond with our fellow people of the dragon skin and. So you saw people doing that. And like, there's a natural kind of a sense of like the, the organizing and the building of this stuff is a game itself. Because you know, in, in a natural sort of fantasy medieval video game, you do have people bonding over certain items and certain things and forming guilds. And here we were sort of forming our own guilds based on this stuff. Um, but then like, within 24 hours, you already had people starting building additional projects on top of it. Lots of derivative projects, people kind of taking Dom's smart contract because, you know, it's all open and basically copying the current contract and, and remixing it into all these fun different ways. You know, you even had Pleaser Dow in a, in, within a few days of it releasing sort of a, a spinoff that was about that was connected into their dog NFT token. Um, so lots of memes and things that started spinning out of it. And then, uh, you know, within four or five days, the prices of the the tokens were just to an insane level. And, and then of course, Adventure Gold came out a few days later and, and Will probably could pick up from there how the madness took off. Well, well real quick though, Jackson, like just backing up. So um, yeah. was this like two weeks ago? I, yeah, I just like 14 days, I think. I mean, it's 14 days ago. Yeah. Okay. So Very like, crazy. I, th there are two distinct like uh, crazy weeks in Ethereum over the last couple of years that I remember. Um, the one is uh, Yam Week. You guys remember that? Where like everything was just all about yams and this this new kind of like you know uh, farming craze, uh, and then yam had some sort of fiasco, and there was like a whole uh, you know rush to save yams. The the second is Loot Week, because as soon as Loot launched, there was just this frenzy of activity as you're talking about, right? And it, it not just price activity, but all of these other derivative projects being built on top of it. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm curious, Will, if maybe you could uh, pick up where Jackson left off, where this is kind of like, I guess, the derivatives phase or the, like the project creation phase of um, people building on top of Loot. So what happened there, uh, Will? Yeah, so the original idea for Adventure Gold was that it's an in-game currency for the Loot ecosystem. People can use it for 
anything within loot. And it's this kind of common layer for translating between all these derivatives. Um, it kind of came about because um, I, the, the, one, of the, one, of the, one of the direct motivations for it was that um, some of the derivatives were charging mint prices in ETH and it felt kind of a little, uh, uh, some of the derivatives were really great. Some of the derivatives were a little cash grabby. Um, to say the least. Um, and and give, give some examples of what these derivatives were for people who weren't part of that. So the very first like... derivative was abstract loot. So it would take your on-chain loot data and create an abstract image that's like generative art based on top of loot. Um, there were uh, there you could you could uh, you could generate a map based on your loot. Um, you could generate. Um, uh, you could generate, uh, there were like characters, companions, all these things. Um, and Adventure Gold, the original vision was, oh, this would be a cool way to permission mints because if everyone uses Adventure Gold, it's now this like ecosystem where this whole ecosystem is is gaining utility and it's not these, like some, some, some derivatives were very thoughtful and very, very well done. Some derivatives were less thoughtful and less well done. And if they all used Adventure Gold, wouldn't that be a really cool way to, to build up the whole ecosystem? Um, and then uh, as I was talking with builders on top of loot, people building um, different RPG games, people building like magic and spell systems, I realized with them that Adventure Gold could be this translation layer where you can use Adventure Gold to translate it to, for example, uh, Loot Wars has XP, which is a fork of Adventure Gold. Um, the Genesis Project has Mana, which is also a fork of Adventure Gold. And Adventure Gold can be this cross-compatible layer um, between all of these different parts of the ecosystem. Um, that was the original vision of Adventure Gold, and that's what's being carried forward. Um, there was this kind of detour of Adventure, Adventure Gold as a governance token um, that I'm happy to dive into if you'd like. But um, but yeah, the, the, the idea is that it's this in-game currency for the ecosystem that could help strengthen all of these projects building on top of it. Yeah, I think I think one key thing that um, if, if listeners aren't familiar um, sh should know is, of course, you had to have loot to participate in all of these derivatives, right? And even with Adventure Gold, is that the case, Will? Like you, you had to actually own loot in order to mint and claim Adventure Gold. Is, is that part of the incentive structure and part of the so, kind of design? Yeah, so I also wanted to use Adventure Gold to set a tone for the loot ecosystem. So I just said 10,000 Adventure Gold for every loot bag. I'm not reserving any for myself. Um, I, I, I want this to be something for the community, something that the community can use. Um, and it was a complete 100% uh, fair launch. Um, and uh, this was to try to set the tone for the, for the community as we thought about derivatives of how to, how to distribute them fairly um, because uh, there were a variety of approaches taken for derivatives. Some were like, claim it now because if you don't claim it, someone else will claim your loot bags item forever. Um, other ones were like, loot holders have an unlimited amount of time to claim and you can claim it whenever you'd like. Um, and I really wanted to set the tone of fair launches um, for the community um, in a way that benefits all loot holders. Um, because I think loot is like, uh, loot has this tension between scarcity and abundance and loot also has this tension between FOMO and short-term thinking and like long-term builders. And I wanted to move people towards abundance and move people towards long-term builders and less on the scarcity side, less on the, on the FOMO side. So guys, I want to uh, zoom out and talk about, try, try and get your guys' opinions as to the holistic definition of this whole loot thing. So not just the loot bags, not just the adventure gold, but I want to, and maybe just more about the concept of loot. So in, in your guys' own words, what is it that we are actually talking about? Because it, it kind of feels like, the way that we can like model out loot is kind of like um, like an, an ant colony or a beehive. It's not like an individual bee that is the actual thing that's alive. It's the whole entire ecosystem. The entity is the the fact that all of these individual moving parts are one seamless, cohered ecosystem. So when you guys zoom out and we step away from the individual bags and the individual items and the individual forks and the individual airdrops, what is loot? Like, what is this thing? Uh, Anish, let's start with you. Sure. So, I mean, at the literal level, like we've all discussed, I think very simply, loot's a collection of 8,000 unique bags of adventure gear that you are free to use in any way. 
I think the abstract level is a little bit cooler though. It's the fact that it's an unfiltered, uncensorable building block for anything else that you want to build on top, whether that's stories, games, experiences, derivatives, and it's all put into the hands of the community free for use. We've all sort of mentioned that these items are in the contract themselves, unlike in a URL. And I think that's super unique about Loot. It's the fact that there's no restriction. It's directly on Ethereum. So, so long as the network is alive, running, uncensorable, those same properties apply to Loot, which makes it a really, really good building block for anyone to build on top, fork, change, experiment, and do whatever they want with it. So it's like a, a creative playground, if you so say. Will, you want to continue the thought? What what the hell is this whole loot phenomenon? Yeah, so related to Anisha's point of this being a creative playground, the, the interesting thing is that there's a debate in the loot community over is loot building a game or, or, or are we already all playing the game? Um, and I think that there's this is really interesting because like loot has already developed its own universe of guilds, of lore, of uh, like of, of in-game currency and economics and and uh and and there's already builders building on top of it so um yeah the loot community is has 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 kind of become this thing much larger than itself um where like there is this just incredible group of guilds um that have already begun um so i think i think that uh that 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 we're already playing the game personally um that we're not waiting for a game to be built that this this is we're all living it Jackson, you want to add anything to uh, this definition of this loot phenomenon? Yeah, I mean, I think there's two sort of like metaphors that I feel like I've been using as I describe it to my friends. Um, you know, one of which is it's kind of, you know, it's kind of it's the, for the more technical minded, it's kind of like an API. You know, you have like it's it's this thing that anyone can plug into and pull from, which, you know, everyone, you know, if you're a developer, like, you know, the power of a good API and like what it can do. So that's really awesome. And then the other one is, is like similar to this idea of a playground. Like I think that uh, I think loot very much is kind of like Legos. Like it ha Legos are these all these different types of little pieces, and you can build so many amazing things with them. And I think to some degree that's sort of what Dom did. Is he just had a bunch of these little tiny pieces of you know that people could look at. You can look at a pile of Legos and think of things you could start building out of them. And I think that's kind of what it was. And I think the longevity and popularity of Lego is kind of a good example of like, just how like how much stuff can come out of just a bunch of small little building blocks. Hey, Ryan. Can we talk about like what you guys are contributing to loot and like, like why? So I think um, many people are perplexed with, you know, why, why people would even have incentive uh, to contribute to, to loot or b build things on top of loot. Like why not go fork and, and create your own loot, right? Like the economic designs we, we've been used to in the past is if you get a list of items in some you know, massive multiplayer online RPG, right? Um, it's very much tied to the game. And there's a reason they've created, generated this list of items like, you know, Diablo three list or world of Warcraft list of, you know, scarce items. It's, to allow people to play the game, right? And if, if you went to them and said, hey, I've got a really great idea, um, all you have to do is just generate the list of items and put that on Ethereum. They, like that would be nonsensical, I think, to um, every, everything we know about how traditionally these metaverses and gaming experiences form. So, but all of you have been contributing to loot in, in various ways. And I guess I wanna know why, like, What's is 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 it? Are there some economics as part of this? Is this just you know a hobby kind of social interest? Why do you think people are incented to actually build on top of this loot project? Um, why don't we start with you, Jackson? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, like it's it's I feel like my sort of incentives or interests have kind of evolved as time has gone on. From minute one, like I was mostly interested in it most interested in contributing uh, to help people, people, other people interact with this thing that I thought was special. So I loved it. I, I wanted other people to be able to experience it too. This is before there was any idea of, of money involved with it or investing or anything. And, and so like, I knew that lots of people didn't know how to get onto Etherscan and actually connect with it and mint from it. So my initial like, contribution was literally just, here's how to do that. Here's a short guide. And from there, like so many people 
took that guide and ran with it and did it. And I had so many messages from people that were saying, this is my first NFT. This is the first time I'd ever done anything with Ethereum. Like that to me is amazing. And so, you know, one of the reasons like I work at Rainbow is because I, I love being, you know, wallets, wallets are kind of this place where you first get to interact with people on their journey in Ethereum and Web3. And I love being at that intersection and helping people with those basics and getting people onboarded. So like my, my role in, I guess, the loot ecosystem, to some degree, I feel like from the get-go has always been making things more accessible, understanding it, uh, promoting it, uh, distilling these things down so that more people can access it. Um, and even like curating, because there's just so many things out there that I've tried to, tried to pick and choose and find the better things that I believe other people should be paying attention to. What gives you the energy to do all that? Is it the <laughs> community or is it like uh, economic a, or what? That's, I mean, I, honestly, it, I think to some degree, I, I really love seeing people get excited about the things that I'm excited about too. Like I, I really love NFTs. I love Ethereum and I believe other people will like them also. And so if I can give people the opportunity to make, to get into that just as easily as I got into it, like it gives me a lot of joy just to see other people getting to experience that too. Like as soon as I minted lots of those loot bags, I started sending them to my friends. Like I sent many divine robes and other bags to friends that like had never had an NFT before. Like I sent one to a friend and two days later he was able to sell it for like $30,000. Like that was his first NFT experience. And so like, I, I didn't know they were going to be worth that much when I started sharing them around, but it, like, it was just fun and I enjoyed it. And it was, it was like a game. Like it was, it was very like enjoyable from like a entertainment perspective. Jackson's going to have a lot of friends requests after this show. <laughs> Jackson's friend. Um, Will, Will, how about you? So you created this whole adventure gold derivative, but, but I'm curious maybe for you, I, I know you, you kind of shared some of the story of, of why you created it, but what are the incentives both for, for you and why you're involved, but, but also why do you think this, you know, so, so many things have been built uh, around this? What's incenting people? Yeah. Um, so I think I'll start with uh, why I made Adventure Gold, I think the way I did with, with no ornament or anything like that um, is because the loot community is a really special place and it's a special place of people thinking long-term about how to build a really, really strong ecosystem. Um, and um, Adventure Gold, uh, I, I mean, I, 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 I assumed it would have absolutely no value. It would just be a fun kind of Dogecoin style thing where you just like tip your friends with it and, you know, like, like, like trade it around and not, not, not that it, that it would, uh, that it would have no, no value. And I thought it would just be like, oh, this is a fun thing for the ecosystem to have. Um, and I think that um, the, uh, like, like were there like I, I I there were no economic incentives at play because I did not expect adventure gold to have any value whatsoever. Um, I just thought this is a fun group of people working together on a long term project, and it's cool for them to have something that can unify a bunch of these different derivatives together. And I think that one of the derivatives, um, it was just people like some of the some of the builders I talked with didn't hold any loot. They just really loved the community. Um, and I guess like. If you want to boil it down to an economic incentive, like sure, building a derivative on top of loot gives you access to a built-in audience, but it still only gives you access to a built-in audience of 8,000 uh, people maximum. Um, so I think that it's really just like the, 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 the community is very special in the way they collaborate. Um, and like building something that inspires others is, is, uh, is ultimately something very satisfying and that, that, is, that, is, that is very rewarding. Anish, what do you think the secret's been of Loot's success and this uh, this wild adoption from the community and these people who are so enthusiastic about building on top of it? I think the answer is in the question that you asked. It's all in the community itself. I think that's been the primary reason that I've been drawn in to help contribute. It's just, it's super exciting seeing things that you built get built, you know, get used by other projects, get used by other builders to incorporate those things into tools. Um, one of the first things that I did was just a quick data repository that I threw out there that, you know, scraped all of the loot uh, attributes, gave some rankings, put some other probabilities. Uh, and then I continued to do that over the weekend for other derivatives that popped up. And a bunch of other projects were built on top of that, that, you know, offered variety of cool things to other people building in the loot community. And so 
it really became like this expansive spider web where even a single small contribution that one person can make has a ripple effect where other people build on top of that. Uh, in the same way, like Will mentioned, Adventures Gold, even that single contribution, now there's other derivative projects that build on top of that and the web just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Um, in the same way, put together like the Loot Project website, Loot Loose and all these other projects and people continue to build on top of it and you know remix it in their own way. Um, and I think the coolest thing is that because all of this is public domain work, because all of it's generally unlicensed or free, unrestricted licenses, everyone is free to go and continue to build on top of this work. To answer your sort of question of like what draws people in though in the community, I think it's when you take a look at AAA games, the hardest part is getting users to play those games. It's the fact that you can build the absolute best game in the world and still people might not play it. In contrast with loot, you have an existing community of thousands of people that not only hold these NFTs, but also extension loot and synthetic loot are excited by that concept. And now you have users that you can immediately tap into by building on top of that ecosystem. And I think that's what draws in a lot of people. The fact that there's already a user base that's ready to play a game that already has the items. And all you have to do is tap into that existing community. Guys, we have so much more to cover. Um, but, but before I, 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 before we get to kind of the next piece of this, which is like talking about the future of, of loot, I want to zone in on this question because I feel like this is um, the base question we started with actually when we when you know we started Bankless. You know, David and I started Bankless on this on this quest to understand um, the value of of crypto systems, right? And we've had so many conversations in the Bankless podcast about related topics, um, Vitalik. Uh, constantly talks about this this concept called credible neutrality, right? Um, also, he had a, a you know famous post uh, about legitimacy, right? Legitimacy being the most scarce asset that any crypto network uh, can have, right? And these these concepts are interwoven in this this question of like what actually is money and how would a, a ground up decentralized money get built? And it seems like the credible neutrality of the issuance, the legitimacy that the community puts into it across these various dimensions are key factors of how something becomes a monetary asset. And so my, my question is like, you know, Bitcoiners will talk about uh, Satoshi, you know, the, the, the immaculate proof of work, no pre-mine, um, you know, Ethereans will talk about like the, the first ICO being Ethereum where, you know, things were relatively pure back then and very hard to replicate those initial conditions here. Um, with loot, I almost see a similar thing taking place in that we didn't have a, a pre-mine. The, the, the founder didn't necessarily have a uh, profit um, seeking motive behind this and, and neither did the community. And, and I'm curious if you think that the, I guess the conception of this project is, is very important in the future of its story. So like a skeptic might come and ask the question like, yeah, if, if, if you know, Fortnite uh, went into this or Epic or it's some like Blizzard, some major game studio just put out a list of items, took a, took a profit share, pushed that in the community, then they'll absolutely destroy loot because it's Blizzard Entertainment. Like, and they're a big gaming publisher. But like, I think the more crypto native approach, given everything we've seen in this space, we'd probably say, no, actually. And it's because an outside entity does not have the legitimacy and the credible neutrality and the issuance of something like loot did. So I guess my question is, do you think the factors of the way loot was brought into existence have been key to its, its success? Is this just another chapter in the same crypto story that we've seen? Anish, I'm curious your thoughts on that first. I think definitely. Uh, I think it's the fact that like most of us have mentioned, we went into this with no expectations, no profit motives, nothing of that sort and built something on top of that. Uh, and that's something fundamentally different from let's say if Blizzard were to come in and build a game where it would be for a profit motive, it'd be to serve the shareholders of Blizzard. Whereas here it's more so let's serve the community members. Let's build something together that all of us would wanna play in the future. Uh, and so it's really that community collaborative aspect of building something, um, which is the unique part. And like Will mentioned earlier, it's like maybe building loot, maybe building all these derivative projects is the game itself mm -hmm. where we're not building towards a game but everything that we're doing to get there is the game it's the collaboration between all of us building adventures gold building these derivative projects where we're in a game itself and so that's super fascinating to me will jackson do you have anything to add on that thread 
Yeah, I think that I think that um, the legitimacy of loot, um, in addition to the way it was launched, where it was a it was a it was a open launch on Twitter that anyone could mint for free, and Adventure Gold being a fair launch, and many derivatives being a being a a fair launch. Um, uh, I think that in addition to that, there's the legitimacy that comes from the experimentation is that, I mean, we're talking about the derivatives that 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 have gained prominence. There's been dozens of derivatives that have not, um, and that's because, like, at the end of the day, there is uh, the, the the community decides what to adopt. Like, I don't think Adventure Gold would have been adopted if I had taken uh, ownership. I don't think it would have, um, because like the derivatives we hear about are the ones that have been broadly accepted. Um, and the community kind of acts as its own, uh, its its own its own its own filter of what they choose and choose not to accept. Um, there's stuff that's not even on the loot derivatives website that like got like downvoted so heavily in the Discord that like it never went anywhere. Um, so yeah, this legitimacy what we see has already been blessed as legitimate because it's what the community really likes. Um, and that's there's that bottom up aspect that's very powerful. Jackson, you want to add any color to that? I mean, no, I think I think really at a very high level, it's just people saw that there were pure motives and how all this stuff happened and there was no like ulterior motive of anything. And I think when people see just people doing fun, good things out of the bottom of their heart, like it, those kinds of things, I think are more likely to catch on in a in a collaborative environment than when some when one person tries to come in and and do something that's going to benefit them. So like. Dom has has sort of a track record of just doing things that don't have any kind of weird ulterior motives to them. He's just known kind of for that within the community. And, um, you know, I think, I think, you know, there's this element of, I don't know if loot would have ca caught on to the degree if, if another random person had have released it with no prior credibility or experience, but Dom had been building and doing things and had a reputation leading up to dropping this experiment. So I definitely think that that played a lot, a lot into it. Like if Dom had not had the good reputation that he had, I don't think it would have gone as far as it has. So guys, Ryan just gave that very like optimistic, oh, credible neutrality. We'll build this thing. Yay. It'll, it's going to work. It's totally going to work. I want to put my devil's advocate hat on and be really, really skeptical about this whole thing. Uh, but before I do that, we're going to have to take a break to talk about some of these fantastic sponsors that make this show possible. Balancer is a powerful platform for flexible automated market makers. Typical AMMs just have two tokens inside of one liquidity pool, which can lead to fractured liquidity across the many pairs in DeFi. With Balancer, you can access the full power of multiple tokens inside of one single AMM, which unlocks an entirely new playing field of possibility. This makes Balancer an awesome building block for so many different use cases. Balancer pools can make asset indices, but instead of paying fees to portfolio managers, Balancer lets you collect the fees from traders who use your portfolio for liquidity. Additionally, Balancer smart pools can be programmed to have properties that change according to predetermined rules, such as changing the swap fee based on market conditions, or even liquidity bootstrapping pools, which can help you launch and distribute your token with day one liquidity. At Bankless, we use a liquidity bootstrapping pool to sell our BAP t-shirts to much success. Balancer V2 brings powerful new features that makes your money work even harder for you. In V2, idle tokens are capable of generating yield in DeFi without sacrificing liquidity in the pool using Balancer's asset managers. Balancer's vault architecture lets you trade between Balancer pools at a fraction of the cost versus trading on other platforms. Balancer's mission is to become the primary source of liquidity in DeFi by providing the most flexible and powerful platform for asset management and decentralized exchange. Dive into the balancer pools at app.balancer.fi. Gemini is the world's most trusted cryptocurrency exchange. I've been a customer of Gemini since I first got into crypto in 2017, and it's been my main exchange of choice to make my crypto buys and sells. Gemini is available in all 50 states and in over 50 countries worldwide. And on Gemini, there are markets for over 30 various different crypto assets, including many of the hot DeFi tokens. And it's one of the few exchanges that has liquid die markets. Gemini just launched their earn program where you can earn up to 7.4% interest on 26 various crypto assets. If you're tired of paying fees in DeFi or you don't want to worry about DeFi exploits, but you still want to earn interest on your crypto assets, Gemini Earn is the product for you. 
you. Another product I'm stoked to get my hands on is the Gemini Crypto Back Credit Card, which gives you 3% cash back on all of your purchases, but paid to you in your preferred crypto asset. When I get my Gemini credit card, I'm going to make sure that I get my cash back in ETH. So whenever I buy something, I get a little bit of ETH bonus back to me at the same time. You can open up a free account in under three minutes at gemini.com slash go bankless. And if you trade more than $100 within the first 30 days after sign up, you'll be gifted a free $15 Bitcoin bonus. Check them out at gemini.com slash go bankless. All right, guys, we are back with the loot panel and I'm about to put on my skeptics hat because Ryan talked about how uh, the legitimacy behind these L1 blockchains are emulated in loot. Uh, and I want to throw a flag and say, well, you can't actually take the legitimacy behind an L1 asset and or an L1 blockchain and actually just apply it to some sort of app layer thing, right? And like, if the, if loot is this game that we're all playing, like it's starting off with these items and then there's going to be this ecosystem built around it. Like, why do we think a nebulous decentralized set of people can actually build this thing in contrast to like some triple A Blizzard Activision game with like, you know, shareholder like responsibilities, a bunch of employees, a lot of capital, a, an, an actual goal that they want to build towards and then like a community of people ready to play their game that they must satisfy. Like loot has none of those things. It doesn't even, it doesn't have a player base. It has like a builder base. It doesn't really have an end goal. It has just a bunch of things that people want to contribute to. Uh, and then there's like this community of people who like, I'm like, like me, I can't actually build anything. I'm not a coder. I can just ape into a loot bag and then wait for the game to be built so that when I'm done with all my bankless stuff, I have this fun RPG that I get to go play who's responsible for building me my game like and and why and why do we even think that this is even remotely feasible like I, i'm i'm uh, again putting on my devil's advocate hat but like why is why do we even think that like crypto isn't just jumping the jumping the shark right now uh jackson you're you're nodding your head pretty well you want to start yeah sure i mean i definitely think that uh i like you i I do share a lot of skepticism about it myself. Like even as an active participant and community member, I, I, I genuinely don't know where this is going to go. Like it might not go anywhere long-term. Um, but to some degree, uh, I'm also not a coder. Like I am the only, like I'm a very non-technical person. And so all I've been able to do is really help spread the word and talk about it. But um, my, in some ways I kind of view loot as, as more of a, it's kind of like how when you go and back a project on like Kickstarter or Mirror, like you have you have some skin in the game. You're not really sure if like the thing is going to actually turn into anything meaningful or interesting. But it's kind of like you see the potential of something being built, and maybe it'll get built or not. But you want to be involved in that story, and owning a loot bag or holding a loot bag gives you a chance to follow along closely with the story be involved in, in it, even from the periphery of being in like a token gated discord or uh, getting to vote on governance, you know, proposals. Um, so like, I, I don't, I really honestly do not know if, if a, a really great game is ever going to come out of this. It, it, there might not be one, but I think that it, it, it will be fun to, to like, I think one of the elements that makes this fun is the fact that we're really early in this whole NFT story, like as a as a as an overarching chapter of Ethereum, we're still relatively early with NFTs. So this, as a project, I think, regardless of how it turns out, will be a, a historical project. And I think that there's lots of there's lots of like uh, legitimacy to the idea of wanting to be involved in something that could turn out to be something really interesting. Will, do you have any uh, thoughts about the skeptic uh, skeptical side of this whole phenomenon? Yeah, David, I'd say that you're already playing the loot game. I mean, <laughs> we're sitting here talking about loot, and we're not talking about one of the many dozens of derivatives. Um, so, like, we are all kind of in our own ways continuing to build the loot ecosystem and how we talk about it and approach it. Um, and but does that building... make it any meaning meaningfully different than just a Ponzi game? It's like, oh yeah, the more people that we can get to talk about loot, like the better. Like it kind of just feels like, yeah, let's just get all the world to talk about loot. Like, is that, sure, sir, is that really an objective? Is built on Ponzi games, sir. <laughs> what yeah, are you but... talking about? <laughs> so I, I would say, I would say that building is defined very expansively and it's 
And and there are lots of people who are working on things that you can do with your loot bags and you can play them in games. And that's really cool. And there's a governance vote right now about how the treasury should be handled. Should there be a treasury? Should we go and fund projects to let you do things with your loot bags? So there's, you have a loot bag, what can you do with it? There's also like, what can we do around the loot ecosystem? And that is that is where I think uh, building is much more broadly defined, um, where loot has now at this point occupied this like part of the crypto cultural consciousness of this just like incredible decentralized experiment. Um, and like at the end of the day, like that's uh, that's uh, that's something that will that will live on and exist parallel to any game that's built. Um, and they they're very symbiotic with each other. Uh, Anish, any thoughts on the skeptics' take on on this whole thing? Yeah, I think even if you're not a builder in the traditional sense of you know writing the contracts, making derivatives, building projects, everyone that is a part of the loot community is sort of like writing the lore for the story already, right? It's the fact that the last two weeks has just been two weeks of an expansive lore of what is to come for loot, right? It's like, we'll look back, maybe in a month, we'll look back at this and be laughing about, you know, this is what the first two weeks were like, you know, this was the Bankless podcast. And after this, all these things came out. And all of us really are just participants that are, it, it, this is an RPG almost, right? It's like, we are the participants in the loot lore, building the lore as we go. Um, and so, yeah, in, you know, two months from now, people might forget, but that lore is always still there for, people to look back at and be like, hey, this was super fascinating. This was super cool. Uh, to me, that's the most exciting part. The fact that we're shaping the story as we go. David, can I answer your question too? Sure. I want to have an answer to that question. Sure. So go like, ahead. why do we, why does Loot have to build a game in the first place? Is my answer to that question, right? Well, so like, it could be, uh, we've, well, hold on though. So we've seen like the institutionalization of Bitcoin, of ETH. What would the institutionalization of Loot look like? Well, that's just like Blizzard, Activision, Epic Games saying, hey, you can now import your, your loot items into our gaming system. Maybe loot doesn't even have to build the game. Maybe it's just this lore and this community and it's other game studios seeking crypto legitimacy, NFT legitimacy, and like pulling loot into their ecosystems. I have no idea. But if, if I was thinking about the, the, the loot team from like uh, an organic business development perspective, I'd be like, let's push this out to all of the gaming studios and figure out how they can start incorporating loot into their games and create like a, an NFT gaming space race there. And then loot has the advantage in that it's the most legitimate. It's the first. This is the fat loot thesis, sir. Are you not familiar? <laughs> <laughs> I love the vision. And there's like, we've seen other projects in crypto successfully get to that point but i just think loot is so far away from that in its current form that like even saying that is like if i was like a bitcoin maxi i'd be like you are just like pushing dreams into these into the minds of just like innocent apers who don't know what they're doing like that that's what a bitcoin maxi would say i think i actually maybe this this is kind of the, the next question for for the panelists so would you guys put on your skeptical takes for, for a minute here? I know we're all bullish <laughs> on loot as a project, right? Or may, maybe some of us aren't, I'm not sure. Um, but um, what about like loot are you still skeptical about? Like what could still kind of go wrong and derail the project, derail the community? Uh, Will, I'm curious your thoughts. I know you mentioned governance earlier. Is, is that something that could take us down? Um. I'd say governance has been the most contentious thing that the community has had to deal with because there's two camps. One camp is um, it should all be decentralized, all fully experimental, all ground up. The community has already decided what's legitimate and what's not. They can continue to have this informal sense of legitimacy just based on how much of something is minted and who uses it and who builds on top of it. Then the other camp is, whoa, we have this huge opportunity to build a treasury that can like provide like seed funding to tons of projects and allow people to go like quit their jobs and work on loot full time. Um, uh, we could, we could, we could, we could uh, convince David to come and join and write lore. Um, we could convince like uh, convince builders to like, I've been talking to builders who are at game studios who are talking about um, like, like working on loot full time. Um, and I think there's two camps. One camp is this should be a fully decentralized experiment. 
there should be no layers of approval. There should be no layers of legitimacy. I'm sympathetic to that, but I think that like the opportunity to build a treasury and build an ecosystem and fund people to actually go do this um, full time, like does that create some short term contentious discussions? Yes. Do I think that's valuable in the long term? Absolutely. Am I in the minority on this? I think so. <laughs> uh, and I think that like governance, I don't think would take loot down, but I think that there is a fork in the road right now of, is this a fully decentralized experiment or are we going to take a like, I don't know how much, $15 million treasury and go fund things with that? Um, that's an open question that the community is still deciding. Anish, what's your take on this? Uh, maybe skeptical, what could take loot down, make it so it doesn't live up to its potential? I think I agree with what Will said in terms of governance has sort of been biggest fork in the road thus far. Um, my first take to that though, is that I think contention is a good thing where it sort of gets everyone talking about the important parts of loot, right? Where it's like, these questions are things that we're going to come up and either they came up today or they're gonna come up a month down the line or a year down the line. And so it's a great thing that we get past them as early as possible. And we sort of decide, you know, this is what we'll do. This is what we won't do. And I think the good part about the fork in the road is that quite literally, if you don't agree, you are free to go fork loot and you know take the community members and go build from that point onwards as well. It's sort of like in lore, you can have multiple derivations of the lore depending on who sees what as you know the de facto standard. And I think that to me is also a part of expanding the loot universe where if there is disagreement, we go build loot in different directions and at the end of the day, it all comes back to this sole, you know, initial project, initial 8,000 bags that were minted. And so I think, yeah, governance will definitely be contentious. I don't see that as a bad thing, though. I, I see that as exciting. Jackson, your take on this. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with everything uh, they just said. I think those are some great points. I think the other element to this is, I think the, the something that I've already started noticing is holding back the ecosystem and potentially could hold it back even more is, is the financial component of it. I think that there are lots of people that do have large stakes in the ecosystem from a financial standpoint as an investment. And there's also, you know, a lot of speculation around, you know, the loot assets themselves and trading on secondary markets. And I've noticed even myself as a contributor, like, as I've said on this podcast, like I got into it, not from a financial standpoint, but like, I just I love the concept dove in and shared it with lots of people. And I think I even, you know, as someone who was in like the Divine Robes group early on, I've even found that to some degree it's become, it's become like a little uneasy to be like a builder in this space around one of these, I guess, grail items, because there is a sense of like, do I have like a bunch of people's bag, literally like bags, like financial bags, like on my shoulder, because like I'm affiliated with this thing. Um, so I think, you know, if, you know, if we're not careful, like to your point about Blizzard or Activision or something coming in and doing a project and they have, you know, boards, board of directors and investors, like we kind of have that to some degree here as well. Like we do have investors and people that have a lot of stake in this. So I think, you know, I think we can't, we can't really, we can't really assume that the space we're in is totally pure and has amazing, like, uh, you know, potential for like, there's a lot of things that could go wrong here too. And I think if we don't, if we don't, if we don't keep those at the top of our mind and think actively about how to solve those problems and difficulties, we could easily see ourselves, you know, having the same struggles that a blizzard might have. Uh, guys, uh, this has been such a fantastic panel and thanks so much for coming and spending some of your time as we explore this uh, undefined ecosystem. And so my, my last question for you guys is, has this whole loot phenomenon, this whole loot concept changed your vision of what the future will look like? And is the concept of the metaverse at all involved with this? Um, Anish, let's start with you. I think it has. Uh, I think this has been a good experiment to play around with initial spurs of the metaverse. I think the two most important things it's done for me, the first has been this concept of asset first development. The fact that even before a game has been developed, you can have assets like NFTs that represent future items in those games and build a community around that and then take community input to then build a game moving forward. So in the case of Loot, it's we you know released eight, Dom released 8,000 Loot bags into the world. 
And now we're building the game, we're building the lore that is used in this game. So it's a really great community bootstrapping mechanism, which I think more and more projects will continue to adopt as we move towards the metaverse. The second thing I think that has been really important for me is the fact that the simple phrase that no one can say no. The fact that I'm a big believer in you know, open source technologies, public domain work, and in the same way, Loot really embodies that. And I think it'll become more relevant in NFT projects and general projects in the future, where people are free to build on top of these. People are free to release derivatives. And that's really useful in not only just you know, spreading the word, whether that's spreading the word about Loot or other projects, but in building that natural community and building these derivative projects, the fact that you can do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want. Uh, so I think, yeah, those are the two things that I think will be the most relevant in sort of future projects or other things that we see being built on top of Loot. Will, how has this whole Loot phenomenon changed your uh, model of what the future might look like? Yeah, I mean, I think that Loot took off because it was an open ecosystem that anyone can build on top of. And that makes me very optimistic about the future of the metaverse. Like, we have Facebook building out metaverse applications. Do you think we're going to get a permissionless open ecosystem from a company that doesn't let you export your friends list? Um, probably not. Um, does Loot show that the success of the metaverse is dependent on these interlocking projects being able to create a whole far greater than uh, far 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 greater than uh, any individual part? I think I think that it showed that. So. I think that the metaverse will be won by the by the open platforms, um, and I think that loot is a is a indicator in in its favor. Jackson, same question to you for you to uh, tie this whole thing off. How has loot changed your version of the future that you have in your head, and uh, how is the metaverse relevant to that uh, future, if it is at all? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the whole thing I don't think has changed me that much other than it's made me believe a lot deeper in the idea of public domain and the concept of, of, of making intellectual property of NFTs far more open. I think that uh, Dom has, you know, with many of his projects, he has pushed forward the idea of just, you know, one of the phrases I see him using on Twitter a lot is, you can do anything you want, take it. Like when people ask him about his projects, like he'll literally just say, you can do whatever you want. And I think that that is like, I, I think the, the truly successful projects that I think will have long lasting impact are going to be the ones that continue to be more open rather than the ones that choose to be more closed off. Because at the end of the day, that's what makes the difference between web three versus web two. And I think if, if we choose not to lean into that, I don't think we're going to be able to see as a more amazing things happen, which is, um, you know, I, I think loot is a challenge to every other NFT project out there saying, how open can you be? And will you dare to do that? Because I think it is scary to some people who are creating things to make what they're creating open. But I think at the end of the day, it's probably in most cases, the right move. Do you dare to be open? Panelists, um, this has been a fantastic discussion. I think we're going to have to end it there, but uh, super excited to do a future bankless panel on Loot again in a, in a few months maybe and see what's going on in the ecosystem. So thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thanks so much. Thank you. Wow, super cool. New mental model there, I think, unlocked for me is like the, the idea of um, moving from open source software, which we already have, to open source assets. That's really what loot is. Very cool. Of course, though, irrespective of price, none of this has been financial advice. It never is on Bankless. ETH is risky. DeFi is risky. Crypto is risky. So is loot. You could definitely lose what you put in, but we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the bankless journey. Thanks a lot. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a bankless premium subscriber to get the most out of your bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anythings, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out 